it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Nick Lane, and I'll just say a few words about him. He's the Professor of Evolutionary Biochemistry at UCL. He's a scientist and a writer, and he has won a number of prizes for his books and for his science, a number of prestigious prizes. He's going to talk to us today on a bioenergetic basis for the three domains of life. And his research looks at the way that energy flow has shaped evolution. So I'm very excited to welcome him to the stage here to give his presentation. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. Um, I, I, I'm very honored to speak here, uh, and I'm also very aware that uh, I know very little about the classification of life, so I have uh, really very little credibility to speak here. So I put in my title um, the word bioenergetic in the hope that um, it would put most people off. Uh, <laughs> and it, it didn't work, did it? <laughs> so what I'm going to try and do is, is take the broadest brushstroke view of the tree of life, which is about as close to classification as I get. Because I've been mystified by this for many years, and I'm, I'm beginning to try and grapple with it and try and make sense of it. Now, this is, I don't know how many people are familiar with it. I imagine most of you are familiar with this. Is that, actually, could I have a show of hands? How many people are familiar with this uh, three domains tree of life? So probably two thirds of you, I should think. Okay. So this actually is, goes back to about 1990, this particular version. And it goes to um, Carl Woese. Uh, and it really was a shock um, to, to <coughs> biology, I, I think, that you'll see ac across in, in the corner the eukaryotes. This is the domain that we all belong to, uh, plants and animals, and really, <laughs> historically, everything that the Linnaean Society has been <laughs> interested in uh, are, are pushed across into a small corner of the tree of life. Uh, and instead, there's these two large domains in blue and in red there, the bacteria everybody's familiar with, and the archaea. So this was a new domain of life introduced by Carl Woese. This was the beginnings of gene sequencing. And it was shocking because, well, nobody knew they existed before. They look, as you can see there, they look the same as bacteria. But they're really different in their genetics and in their biochemistry. So different from each other that... Woes argued that bacteria and archaea were as different from each other as we are from bacteria. And now that's very hard to swallow. Uh, and a lot of people did not swallow that very well. But at the level of just gene sequences, that's roughly the shape of the tree of life. There are some questions, though. Bacteria date back 4 billion years, pretty much, in the fossil record. The archaea do as well, so far as we can tell. Um, and you can tell from the length of the branches there roughly how much genetic variation there is within these groups. There's a lot of genetic variation within the bacteria and the archaea. So they have practically infinite population sizes. Four billion years of evolution, what did they come up with? Really small, simple cells. Why, you know, in their biochemistry, they're marvelously complex, but in, in their morphology, they're really simple. So something was happening down that green branch towards the eukaryotes that didn't happen anywhere else in the tree of life. And you can see almost from looking at that, I've, I've given it a provocative title, genes are not enough. The bacteria and the archaea between them have explored genetic space far more than eukaryotes ever did, and yet they never came up with the trick of becoming large and complex or really multicellular. So what was happening? Well, I'm going to try and explain this evening. It's a bit ambitious, and I'll do my best to keep it as little biochemistry and as simple as I can, simple so that I can understand it, but um, I want to try and answer the question, why do we see these big differences between the bacteria and the archaea and the eukaryotes? Okay, this is my perception of a bacterial view of life. They start 4 billion years ago, and we see fossils, literally 3.8 to 4 billion years ago, that look so similar to modern bacteria that people have even tried to put them in modern groups like cyanobacteria. It's very controversial, but they really do uh, look like modern cells. And so through four billion years worth of evolution, nothing's happened. They haven't changed. We still see the same cells. And you could do exactly the same thing for the archaea. They're flatlining. They, despite all this metabolic virtuosity, they've not really done anything. 
And just once in this whole four billion year trajectory of life on Earth, complex cells arose, the, the eukaryotic cells, cells with a nucleus. Eukaryote just means true nucleus. And all eukaryotes are really closely related to each other. We are really, at the level of cells, at the level of cellular biochemistry, we are almost indistinguishable from fungi or really, frankly, from plants as well. Um, they've just got chloroplasts. So what's going on? I like to uh, go back to the beginnings of modern biology. Um, Schrodinger, a physicist, of course, um, was a direct inspiration to uh, Crick and Watson and a whole age of uh, DNA. And it's partly because he saw it in informational terms. This was the first use of the term code script uh, in biology, to my knowledge. So he was beginning to think in terms of information. This was 1943, 75 years ago this year. Um, and it was wartime, of course, and so thinking in terms of codes was uh, probably part of the uh, time. But he was talking in terms that most modern biologists would recognize, contain some kind of code script in which um, evolutionary development is encoded. He also talked about energy, or more specifically, entropy. And he said, in far more archaic language, that life feeds on negative entropy. And the device by which an organism maintains itself stationary at a fairly high level of orderliness really consists in continually sucking orderliness from its environment. Very few biologists these days would talk in anything like those terms. Um, and I suspect, you know, we've had, we've had decades of uh, wonderful research on genes and gene sequences and everything I'm going to say this evening uh, would be impossible to say without that information. But we've also neglected, largely, the other side of Schrodinger's book, the side about energy and entropy. And he had a footnote where he said, if I'd been catering for physicists alone, and he might have said everybody, frankly, I should have let the discussion turn on free energy instead. Now, free energy is quite a technical term, but really it just means the energy that's available to power work, which is not being dissipated as heat. So all the work that's going on in muscle contractions, in any, uh, any enzyme which is changing its conformational state, it's all driven, tends to be driven by ATP. It all requires free energy to drive that. So he's really saying it needs some form of respiration. Now, when he wrote that, 1943, um, it was known that, that DNA uh, was the genetic, the hereditary code, but not many people did know that. Uh, Avery had, had published it around about that same time. Um, and this was also 20 years or so before Peter Mitchell put forward his chemiosmotic hypothesis for how respiration works. Um, and, and, it, and it then took a long time after that before anybody agreed with him. There was a period of 20 years known as the Oxfoss Wars where people were really quite unpleasant to each other. Um, and eventually, it turned out that Mitchell was right. This is uh, Mitchell in 1946 in Cambridge with Jennifer Moyle, who was his uh, really lifelong uh, colleague. And it was Jennifer Moyle who did uh, most of the experiments. Mitchell was a genius. He had brilliant ideas, but he was cack-handed in the lab. And it was really Jennifer Moyle who who did the work that proved that, uh, that, that he was right. But back in, um, back in 1957, uh, four years before he, he, he put this chemiosmotic hypothesis forward, he wrote, uh, he, no, he went to a conference in Moscow um, on the origin of life. So it, it was no accident that it was in Moscow because um, they were interested, being communists, they were interested in a materialistic explanation for the origin of life. And a lot of the people who went who were interested in that question, people like J.B.S. Haldane and J.D. Bernal, were staunch communists as well. So they all went out to Moscow. Uh, Mitchell was not, but he was there as well. And he was there with some really interesting ideas on the origin of life. And let me just quote this to you, because it's, it's a very different way of seeing life to anybody else I've come across. He says, I cannot consider the organism without its environment. From a formal point of view, the two may be regarded as equivalent phases between which dynamic contact is maintained by the membranes that separate and link them. So he's thinking about bacteria here, but he's saying that the inside and the outside of bacteria are equivalent phases, that there's an equivalence between what we would say is alive and the inanimate environment around. And when you start thinking about questions like the origin of life, then that's actually a very productive way of seeing 
the question. And he was considering it in very simple terms. Um, and and, and it, it takes, it, it's, a, it's a curious thing, it takes a while to deconstruct difficult uh, questions to the level uh, of this kind of simple question that I can comprehend, and this is what he was talking about. He, the question was, how do bacteria keep their insides different to their outside? And it's obvious that it costs them energy to do so because the outside is going to try and get in just for entropic reasons. And so cells have proteins in the membrane pumping things out, and that's maintaining the difference between the inside and the outside of cells. So it costs energy to select particular molecules and to physically pump them out against a concentration gradient. And so he, he realized that you can gain energy, you can tap energy by letting them come in again. And he had the genius to realize that the way in which bacteria keep the outside out uh, and the inside different to the outside could also explain how respiration works in humans and all other animals because it was known that a membrane was necessary, it was known that protons were necessary, and he realized that it's as simple as proton pumps in a membrane. And that's the essence, really, of what's going on. This is what's happening in respiration. This is an absurdly simplified diagram, but it gives you a feel, not only in bacteria, but also in our own mitochondria. So, it turned out that not only was Mitchell right, but he was far more right than probably even he could have appreciated because all life works that way. He knew bacteria did. He'd never, you know, he hadn't come across the archaea. He didn't realize initially that photosynthesis works exactly the same way as respiration in that sense. And actually, really, it's a, it's a bold statement, but it's broadly true. Proton flux, which is to say the movement of protons from outside a cell into the cell, powers both carbon and energy metabolism across all of life. Uh, there are some fiddling exceptions to that statement, but it's broadly true. That's to say it powers growth, and without growth there's really nothing. Uh, and it's interesting that growth was missing from Schrodinger's comment. He said, how do you keep life in an orderly stationary state? Um, the energy is required for growth. And it costs energy to pump protons out again. So how did it arise? There's a little bit of a uh, chicken and egg question about it, but it could be um, that harnessing proton gradients arose before uh, the actual pumping of protons out. It could be that there are natural proton gradients and that they could have been tapped and harnessed in some way before cells learned how to generate them themselves. How can we possibly know? Well, we can try and get to the roots of the tree of life itself, and this is a very different way of seeing it to the three domains tree that I showed you at the beginning. This is uh, a tree from Bill Martin, uh, who is a brilliant phylogeneticist, um, rather a controversial figure, and this goes back to 1998. And I'm showing you um, for two reasons, really. This is a conceptual tree based on whole genomes. And what he has here, you see at the bottom where it says Luca, this is the last universal common ancestor of all of life. And it's a kind of a hydrothermal vent that you see down there, and there are two separate emergences from that hydrothermal vent. This is a very radical idea. I thought he was bonkers when I first heard him say that. I now think he's correct. Um, and I'll come on to why that might be. And then the eukaryotes at the top, you can see this is a fusion of branches. So eukaryotes are being produced by the bacteria and the archaea somehow coming together in a way that we can't really agree among ourselves in the field, but uh, I will put forward my own ideas on it. So. First of all, let's consider then the differences. Why would you even imagine that the differences might be so great that you would have two separate emergences? Notice I'm saying emergences. I'm not saying origin. We know they share a common origin because they have so many things in common that it's undoubtedly the case that bacteria and archaea have a common ancestor. So on the left-hand side there, uh, you see the things that bacteria and archaea have in common, the universal genetic code uh, of DNA, the ribosomes, these are the protein building factories, um, the, the enzymes and the genes involved in transcription, so this is reading off DNA into RNA and translation, so making the proteins from RNA transcripts. The enzymes involved in these and the genes that code for them are basically the same, they are homologous in bacteria and archaea. 
Parts of intermediary metabolism, but not all of it, things like the Krebs cycle, in part, are found in both groups. And as I say, the membrane bioenergetics, things like the ATP synthase, they are found in both groups. And so we assume that the common ancestor had all of those things. But the things that are different are really quite shocking. So the cell membrane is different. And I'll show you how in a moment, but, but essentially fundamentally different in its structure in bacteria and archaea. So are the enzymes that are required to make it. So is the cell wall. So this difference that Peter Mitchell talked about, the, the membrane that separates the two phases, the inside and the outside of the cell, are fundamentally different in bacteria and archaea. Um, other pathways that you might think will be ancient and important, glycolysis, this is the pathway for fermentation, that ever since Pasteur we've assumed that this is an ancient pathway. Well, it's very different in bacteria and archaea. It looks as if it emerged separately in the two groups. Perhaps the most amazing of all is DNA replication. The enzymes and the genes responsible for DNA replication are mostly not the same in bacteria and archaea. It looks as if DNA replication emerged independently on two separate occasions. It's not just the depth of branching, because the enzymes for transcription and translation, which you might think are equally fundamental, uh, are clearly related and clearly do share a common ancestor. So <clears throat> what kind of a cell was that common ancestor? Whatever I tell you this evening, it may be that what I tell you is just not true. It would be nice if it was true, but this is a real problem. Uh, regardless of whether what I tell you is right, there is a real problem here, uh, at which I, I, I think is one of the more exciting questions in biology. This is the membrane. Uh, the difference between, on the left-hand side, the membranes of archaea, um, and on the right-hand side, the membranes of bacteria. Now, to a first glance, they probably look exactly the same. Um, isoprenes uh, and fatty acids, those are the two different main components of the membrane. We have fatty acids. We have bacterial-type membranes in our own cells. Um, and then there's a difference in bonding, an ether bond or an ester bond. And again, you might think that's a trivial difference, that it's related to adaptation to different environments. All that makes reasonable sense. But then right in the middle, where it says G1P and G3P, this is glycerol 1-phosphate or glycerol 3-phosphate. This is the head group um, which makes the, the membrane into a bilayer. This is hydrophilic. It interacts with water, and that's why membranes will spontaneously form in solution. Um, these are different stereoisomers of each other, different hands, a left hand and a right hand version of the same molecule. In the chemistry, the molecule is exactly the same. There's no selective reason why natural selection will pick this hand over that hand. They're exactly the same. Um, but they can't fit into the same enzymes. They are effectively, they, they, they simply seem to be different for probably trivial reasons. We don't know why. It looks as if this group happened to pick that enzyme, which produces glycerol 3-phosphate, and this other group of bacteria happened to pick the other one, glycerol 3-phosphate. So it really is a major difference between those, those two groups. It implies that the common ancestor did not have these glycerol phosphate head groups at all. It certainly had a membrane, but it didn't have a membrane like a modern bacterial membrane or a modern archaeal membrane. It probably didn't have glycerol phosphate head groups. So here's the paradox then. Membrane bioenergetics seem to be universal, but the membranes themselves are not. Um, and how could it be resolved? Well, there's, there's different ways that it could be resolved, but the most interesting one, to me at least, is that it could be resolved if life originated in an environment where there were geologically sustained proton gradients. And there are such places, and this is uh, probably the nicest example, but there are others as well. This is, uh, this is Deb Kelly, who was the captain of the Alvin submersible, um, who discovered this is a lost city vent. It's in the uh, vent field. It's uh, off the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, um, uh, about three kilometers down, and it's very different to the kind of vents that most people are familiar with, the black smoke events, which are belching black smoke out of the top. Um, and actually, she's got there in her left hand uh, a lump of black smoke event. You can see that it's really a chimney through which smoke would emerge. And in her right hand, she's holding something which is, looks like a porous sponge, really. It's, this is a lump from Lost City itself, and it's riddled with interconnected pores. So a very different type of vent system, and they're known as alkaline hydrothermal vents. And 
they had been predicted, funnily enough, 10 years before they were discovered by Mike Russell, who's a geologist who's now at uh, NASA JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Uh, and, and he was a rather marginal figure, I would say, in the field. He had brilliant ideas, but nobody really tried to understand them because they were pretty obscure, um, until the discovery of Lost City. And, and when, uh, when, when, when Lost City was discovered, then his ideas and his predictions, which, uh, which really matched very well, uh, suddenly came to center field. And this is a Photoshop portrait that Nature did. This was a feature article from Nature, um, depicting him as Erasmus, as a Renaissance man. And they, they, they called him Naissance man, Naissance as in the birth of life. Um, so the points that I, I want to bring out of this is that you can see on the right-hand side, these vents really are like sponges. They're riddled with pores. It's a labyrinth of interconnected pores. Today, it's made of uh, calcium carbonate or agonite, but we think four billion years ago, before there was any oxygen in the oceans, there was a lot of iron in the oceans, and, well, and the conditions should have been rather different. The chemistry should have been different. So the vents themselves should still have been alkaline. They're very rich in hydrogen gas. So hydrogen is bubbling in alkaline fluids straight out of the out of the ground. Um, and and these, these walls should have had contained catalytic iron sulfur minerals, very similar, in fact, in their structure to the kind of iron sulfur clusters that we still find in many proteins today. So this is roughly what Mike Russell was pointing to. On the right-hand side there, you see a cell as I've already depicted it. This is a bacterial cell or something with a membrane. It's got a proton pump. It's pumping protons outside. And then on the left-hand side, you, you're seeing a kind of an inorganic cell inside, deep inside one of these hydrothermal vents. And it's equivalent in its topology. So it's relatively acid outside where you have the acidic seawater. And four billion years ago, it really was acidic. There was a lot more CO2 then. Uh, and so we think the ocean pH would have been about five, maybe six. We don't really know. And on the inside, you have these alkaline fluids, which are kind of wending their way through the vents and would have been about pH 10 or 11. So there's potentially quite a big difference uh, in acidity between the inside and the outside across, in this case, uh, a, a relatively thick inorganic barrier containing catalytic uh, minerals like iron sulfur minerals. You might wonder, how can you go from an inorganic system to a complex system, an organic system like that, um, an analogy, well, it's a bit like trying to look for the face of Christ in a cloud or something. You can very easily delude yourself into seeing things that aren't really there. Um, but we can also say, okay, well, there is a topological analogy. Can we think of any way to convert it into a homology where really one does give rise to the other? And for a clue, we can look to the first cells, the earliest cells. Again, there is no agreement about what these early cells actually are because the deep branches in the tree of life are very uncertain. But there's a good argument to say that in the, in the, in the archaea, some of the earliest cells were probably the methanogens. And within the bacteria, some of the earliest cells were probably the acetogens. The reason I say that is that they have a very simple way of making a living. They're basically reacting hydrogen with carbon dioxide, in the case of methanogens, to make methane, in the case of acetogens, to make vinegar, acetic acid is vinegar. So next time you, uh, your wine is spoiled, just think that the bacteria that are spoiling it are some of the oldest bacteria on Earth. The reason uh, that I think they may be the most ancient is because they're using this simple pathway, which is the only, there are six known pathways of fixing carbon dioxide, converting carbon dioxide into organic molecules. Across the whole of life, there's only six known pathways of doing that. And this is the only one which is found in both bacteria and archaea. And so it's the only one that you'd like to say was probably in their common ancestor. But as I say, it's not really agreed. In the last few years, um, people like Rolf Tower and Wolfgang Buckel have worked out how methanogens work. And it's, uh, I'm not going to go through the details of that, but the cow there gives, uh, you know, cows produce massive amounts of methane. They are uh, responsible in good measure for, for global warming. They are an issue. And the methane is coming from methanogens. Um, and the way that it works, you can see hydrogen up there coming into a cell. Effectively, the hydrogen is being, the two electrons from hydrogen are being split and they're being sent different ways and finally reunited. 
So I'm not going to go through the details, but it's a kind of a merry-go-round that's just splitting these electrons and reuniting them together and pushing them out as methane. And you've got this merry-go-round going on and on and on, and the only thing that's conserved, all the electrons from hydrogen end up in methane, and the methane is the waste product, which you may as well set light to. Um, the only thing that's conserved, you can see MTR there, is a pump. It's the methyl transferase, and it's responsible for pumping a proton or a sodium ion out of the cell. In other words, this whole process of generating massive amounts of methane waste um, gives you what you already have in some of these hydrothermal vents. What do they use it for? Well, they use it for powering growth directly. And it's a really simple system. ECH stands for energy converting hydrogenase, but it's a protein that sits in the membrane. The protons come rushing through it, and it reduces, which is to say it, it passes its electrons onto another very ancient protein containing iron sulfur clusters, and it's that that drives growth. So I won't go into the details of that, but really what we're dealing with here is iron sulfur clusters in a membrane protein driven by a proton gradient across that membrane. And that's all it requires for methanogens to grow. So if you have a natural proton gradient across a barrier in a hydrothermal vent, could that do the same job? Could it actually drive growth? Well, there's a problem immediately, and the bioenergeticists have been pointing this out, not only to me, but to anybody who dares to suggest that life might start an event. Uh, the, the gradient will collapse immediately. Um, so you can imagine it. Here you have a membrane, which is the bar. You have some kind of a protein sitting in it. You can think of it like a turbine. Um, and protons come through it, doing some work. But after a few minutes, all the protons will have, and they'll have balanced out. You'll have collapsed any gradient. The concentration will be exactly the same on both sides. Um, so how do you get out of that situation unless you can actively pump the protons out again? Well, there is a way of doing it because in a, in a hydrothermal vent, we have continuous flow. So if the protons that come in can leave again, get washed away um, passively without any active pumping going on, then maybe it could work. And so this, I'm not going to go into the maths at all. Um, I, I just, this is really just to show you that there was some maths involved in this done by a PhD student of mine, and I struggled to understand it. Um, but these are, these are some of the classic equations of electrochemistry. Uh, and this is an absurd model. But if this doesn't work, we can be certain that it will not work at all. So this is a, a kind of proof of concept. What we have at the top is, it says, acidic laminar flow. So this is the ocean water wending its way through. Underneath, we have uh, alkaline laminar flow. So laminar flow just means that it's, it's effectively going in a straight line and not mixing very much, and that allows you to keep pretty steep gradients. And we have a, a cell which is wedged precariously in a kind of an inorganic barrier, which is obviously not realistic, uh, but it means that on one side of this cell, it's exposed to mildly acidic, in fact, in this case, pH 7, so neutral, uh, and on the other side, pH 2. 10, alkaline fluids, so a three pH unit gap, that's three orders of magnitude, a thousand fold difference in proton concentration between the two sides of that cell. And the green thing is a protein which is like a turbine sitting in that membrane which can power some form of work. And so the question is, well, if the protons come in through that protein, and they can also come in across the membrane, and they can also leave passively across the membrane, and hydroxide ions can come in, and we can try and define the permeability of all of these things and count the number of protons. That's essentially all it comes down to. We count protons. It's worse than counting sheep, believe me. Um, well, we get exactly what everybody told us we would get. Um, you put a, a modern membrane there. You put your protein in. The protons come rushing through the, the protein, and they collapse the gradient. It doesn't matter how big the gradient is. It can be 5 pH units or 1 pH unit, and within... Two seconds in our model, uh, which is a you know, meaningless time unit, but essentially immediately the gradient collapses and is gone. It cannot work. But that's with modern membranes. If we consider a really leaky membrane, something like a fatty acid vesicle, so the protons could come in and they can leak out again, then we can do the same calculations. And, and this is showing different permeabilities of the membrane. And each one here 
is showing a tenfold difference in permeability. So the orange one down at the bottom is what you've already seen. This is like a modern membrane. And so the protons come in, they can't leave again, the gradient collapses in no time. But the blue ones at the top are like a fatty acid vesicle. They are five orders of magnitude more permeable to protons. They can come rushing in and they can leave again. And that, you can see, keeps all the energy in the system. So we're losing only a small amount of energy. In other words, so long as you've got a really leaky, really bad membrane, you might say, exactly the kind of thing you might have towards the origin of life, a, a, a membrane which has not really been uh, adapted by you know, millions of years of evolution, um, it will actually work. And so this, equivalent to a methanogen, with this energy converting hydrogenase, and we put an ATP synthase in there as well, but don't worry about that, um, technically could actually work. Um, but it's going to be completely dependent on being in a vent with the natural gradients in the vent. And, and vents don't last forever. They might last, in the case of Lost City, we think about 100,000 years. So quite a small time window, really. And maybe you have vent systems right next to each other, but you're still dealing with rather finite periods of time. And when the vent dies, then all these protocell things that are living in it, they're also going to die as well. You can only escape and take over the world if you are able to pump your own protons out. So how do you go from a situation that could work, that the last universal common ancestor of all of life could actually have been something like that? Um, how did it leave? Well, the problem is you've got a really leaky membrane you invent, let's say, a proton pump, and you pump protons across the membrane. Well, the membrane is so leaky, they come straight back at you. And so this is showing orders of magnitude as you're making your membrane less and less permeable until a modern membrane at the end with proton pumps inserted. And all you need to see there is it has no effect. There is no benefit to improving the membrane or to having a proton pump just because the more you make the membrane less leaky, the more you cut yourself off from the natural gradients in the vent. And the, the, the more you have a, a proton pump with a leaky membrane, the more the protons just come straight back at you. So you're in a kind of a, a loop here. Well, we kind of got stuck there ourselves for a while um, until we realized that methanogens use what's called a sodium proton antiporter. They're really dependent on it. If you knock this protein out, they can't grow at all. Uh, and we thought, well, what would happen if you were to put this antiporter in the membrane in a hydrothermal vent? Um, so one proton comes in, and it's like a, a revolving door. Every time a proton comes in, a sodium ion goes out. And so over time, you're going to accumulate sodium ions outside. You're going to physically push them outside. The key here is that membranes are far less, a fatty acid membrane is far less permeable to sodium than it is to uh, protons. So the protons will come straight back, but the sodium will stay out. And that gives you more power. I mean, so you lose power immediately because more protons come in. But for all the protons that come in, sodium ions go out. And so you get about 60% more power in our model just by adding this one protein to the membrane. So what can you do with that power? Well, it effectively allows two things. It allows you to survive on much lower gradients because you're getting more power for any one gradient if you need a certain amount of power to grow at all, and you get 60% more power from this, it effectively allows you to grow on around about 10 to 50-fold lower gradients. So you could spread through vents and survive in areas where there's very weak gradients. You can diverge. Um, but also, it pays back pumping. So you pump a proton out, and there's a chance it's going to come back through the antiporter, and so a sodium will go out, and that's more likely to stay out. And so you get a little bit more energy for every proton that you pump out. And, and that gives a benefit. So you can, this is on, in, in the inset one there is what you've already seen. It's flatlining. There's no benefit to pumping. But here you can see you improve the membrane a bit and you get a little bit more power. You improve the membrane a bit more, you get a little bit more power. And so there's a continual driving force towards sealing the membranes, making them proton tight, and having you know, a functional cell that can generate its own gradients. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but on the left-hand side is what you've already seen. Here is um, a, a, a kind of last universal common ancestor living in a hydrothermal vent dependent on geological uh, proton gradients. Then we see the methanogens. You've already seen that as well in the middle there. 
Uh, they've had to invent some biochemistry. They've had to invent a pump. And that pump is actually, in its structure, quite similar to a sodium proton antiporter. Um, and so nothing's changed. It's basically doing what it always did. It's come up with one invention. And in bacteria, the acetogens right across at the, uh, at the far side there, well, they've just inverted the same pump. Rather than protons coming in, it's now doing the reverse. It's oxidizing ferredoxin and pumping protons out. So it hasn't even bothered to invent a new pump. It's come up with some slightly different biochemistry, but it's basically um, the, the, the amount of evolutionary invention going on seems to depend, to me, on the direction of proton flux through that one protein. And the known biochemistry of methanogens and acetogens all depends on the direction of flux through that one protein. And so you can imagine, and this really is imagination, but you can imagine um, that Luca, the last universal common ancestor, lived in a hydrothermal vent, uh, lived on natural proton gradients, got to the point where it has genes and proteins and so on, so I'm, I'm not talking about the origin of life, I'm talking about relatively primitive cells, but still with the sophistication of genes. Um, it comes up with a sodium proton antiporter, uh, which allows it to spread through the, events and, through the vents, and it gives it some benefit from pumping. And so we then have a short time window by the look of it, but the bacteria and the archaea seem to have tightened their membranes independently. They came up with these different forms of glycerol phosphate head groups and so on, and they seem to have left the vents uh, independently. So <clears throat> is this entirely a product of a deranged imagination? It might be. Um, you can also see, why would they have a different cell wall? Well, the cell wall depends on the membrane. All the components of the cell wall, you've got to put them through proteins in the membrane. So if you've got different membranes, you're going to have different cell walls. What about DNA replication? The origin of replication is bound to the membrane. If you have a different membrane, you will have a different origin of replication. So you can understand the other differences between bacteria and archaea in those terms. And this is um, this obscure protein that I've been talking about, the energy-converting hydrogenase. It was certainly obscure to me. Um, here it is. It turns out that it actually is the membrane part is, in fact, a sodium proton antiporter, another obscure molecule that's been important in my story. But there it is, right at the center of the energy-converting hydrogenase. And across there, this is the bacterial form of complex one in respiration. So we have in ourselves exactly the same protein in our own mitochondria. We have a slightly more complicated version with all kinds of other subunits bound onto the surface. Look at it. It's an energy-converting hydrogenase in red. It's the ECH. And inserted into the middle of the ECH, there are three sodium proton antiporters. So these proteins that I thought were obscure and something to do with methanogens in, in deep vents turn out to be actually critically to, to how we ourselves operate. Uh, so I would see this as being encouraging. It's, it, I, I think it means I'm slightly less deranged than I thought I might have been. So for the last 10 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about the third domain, about ourselves, the uh, eukaryotes, the large, complex cells with a true nucleus. Why is it that it took so long for eukaryotes to evolve? Why did it only happen once? Why did bacteria flatline throughout the whole four billion years of evolution? It's what I like to think that John Maynard Smith uh, would have called an evolutionary scandal. He liked to call things uh, that are not supposed to happen, so he thought a lot about sex and the evolution of sex and various ancient asexuals he, he described as an evolutionary scandal. And this is, by his terms, uh, a scandal. The problem is that all complex life on Earth is composed of this one type of cell, the eukaryotic cell. And eukaryotes arose almost by definition, because we know they share a common ancestor, we share a common ancestor, by definition that only arose once, but there's no evidence that there are other types of complex life that's simply not to be seen. And all eukaryotes, all plants and animals and fungi and amoeba and everything else share a tremendous number of traits. You could look it up in a textbook and, you know, the, the, the nucleus, okay, the nuclear pore complexes. There are 70 different proteins in a nuclear pore complex, and they're the same. Oh, dear. Okay, thank you. They're the same 
in a fungus or an amoeba as they are in us. The membrane systems, like the endoplasmic reticulum and so on, they're the same in all eukaryotes. So, that, you know, you could write page after page of detailed similarities between all of them. And bacteria and archaea essentially don't evolve any of those traits, have never evolved any of those traits in anything resembling the eukaryotic form. So some people talk about bacterial sex, for example, but what they really do is they pick up bits of DNA from the environment and they recombine it into their genome. So it's piecemeal. It's a bit of DNA and it's not reciprocal. What eukaryotes do is they fuse two whole cells together. They line up all the chromosomes and then they recombine systematically and reciprocally across all of those chromosomes. It's a very, very different process to anything that's ever been seen in bacteria. So the scandal then is if all these traits arose step by step, and there's no reason to think they didn't, and each of those steps offered an advantage of some sort, and there's no reason to think that it didn't, uh, then why did none of them arise in bacteria? So a, a nice analogy is the eye. So eyes have arisen in, essentially independently on at least 60 or se 70 separate occasions. I say essentially independently because in the case of animals, uh, we do share a common ancestor that had a light-sensitive spot of some sort, and there are a few regulatory genes, like Pax6, for example, which are found in all these diverse groups. But those regulatory genes essentially independently recruited all the rest of the genes required to make an eye on all of those different occasions. And there are other examples. The, in the middle there with the red arrow, this is Eudlina. This is an alga. Um, it has a, a, essentially an eye spot. Uh, and in that eye spot, it uses a rhodopsins, which are closely related to our own rhodopsins in our own eyes. God knows how we actually acquired our rhodopsins in our eyes from algae, but it seems that we did somehow. Um, and across then at the far side there, uh, that's an extraordinary thing. This is, um, uh, I think it's a dinoflagellate. It's a single-celled protist that lives in the oceans. Uh, and, and so this is a single cell, and in that single cell you see a structure that looks a lot like a camera eye. Um, it's got a retina, which is made of chloroplasts. It's got something that looks a lot like a lens, and it's got a cornea, which is made of mitochondria. This is an extraordinary structure. So this is pure convergent evolution of a structure equivalent to a camera eye, which has happened completely independently. This is what natural selection says should happen. <coughs> You should see lots of different types of eye arising in different environments, different ecological contexts, uh, because it offers different types of advantage in different circumstances. But natural selection should say the same thing about having a nucleus. If a nucleus is a good thing, then you should see lots of different types of equivalents to a nucleus in the same way you would to an eye, or sex, or phagocytosis, the ability to go around and engulf uh, cells. Bacteria never do it. It's not only about they have a cell wall, or they're small, there are some giant bacteria, and there are plenty of archaea that don't have a cell wall, and they still don't become phagocytes. Why not? Uh, this is the slide you've seen already. I'm coming back to this question. What was happening down the branch that was going to our own type of cell that was not happening in the bacteria and the archaea? And the difference is at the level of cells. It's not at the level of large multicellular organisms. This is Euglena again. Uh, and then to the right there, you can see a tiny little cell that you probably can't see. Uh, it says um, pl planktomycetes next to it. Uh, these are relatively complex bacteria with a kind of a compartment that some people have said, well, this is a little bit like a nucleus. It's not very much like a nucleus, but it's there. It's a complex bacterium. And the reason you can't see it is I've put it to scale. That's roughly how big it is in relation to Eudlina. Um, the, 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 these fancy structures around the edge of Euglena are the chloroplasts, by the way. They're spectacular things. You don't need to know anything about what's inside that cell to realize that it's a bigger scale altogether, that it's a complex cell with lots of things going on inside. Cell biology has ramped up orders of magnitude between the more complex bacteria and what you might call a bog-standard alga. So there's really there's some kind of a black hole at the center of biology. We don't know anything about how all of these structures arose. And we can go back to this uh, tree from Bill Martin to this chimeric fusion of two cells. This is a genomic fusion. We know for a fact that there are genes in our own nucleus that come from bacteria, and we know for a fact that there are genes in our own nucleus that come from archaea. Question is, how? <laughs> 
I don't have time to go into detail here, but this, is a, this was really the biggest smoking gun of them all, and it was an illusion. So there are quite a large group of eukaryotes, <coughs> single cell things, um, that look simple, and they don't have mitochondria. And they were thought for a long time to be evolutionary intermediates, that they were a kind of living fossil from early eukaryotic evolution uh, that had not yet really developed much complexity. Well, it turns out that a lot of these are, are, are parasites and quite nasty. So Giardia, for example, causes, I'm sure most people know, explosive diarrhea. Um, and and a, lot of, a lot of them are parasites, so they've had a lot of, um, a, a lot of medical interest in their structures, and as often happens in science, the people who've done this work, and there have been quite a lot over 20 or 30 years or so, beautiful work, uh, largely uncredited in, in, in many respects, but beautiful work, um, shows that they all had mitochondria and they lost them. They became either adapted into smaller, simpler structures like mitosomes or hydrogenosomes, or they lost them altogether in the case of monocircominoides, which picked up some genes from bacteria to do iron sulfur cluster assembly and then lost their relics mitochondria. <clears throat> so we now know that all eukaryotes either have or had mitochondria and lost them, uh, which means that uh, the acquisition of mitochondria was a very early event in eukaryotic evolution. Now, I'm sure you all know, going back to uh, well, actually, going back even before Lynn Margulis, but Lynn Margulis was the person who really nailed the idea back in 1967 um, that mitochondria were bacteria, um, <coughs> formerly free-living bacteria, that chloroplasts were formerly free-living cyanobacteria. She also thought various other cell structures were derived from bacteria by endosymbiosis. Not many people agree with her about the other ones. Um, <coughs> but everybody pretty much now has agreed that mitochondria derive from bacteria. So what was the host cell that acquired these bacteria that went on to become the mitochondria? This has, again, changed a lot over the last five years. Um, <coughs> turns out it was an archaeon. There's almost no doubt about that whatsoever now. On the left-hand side here is the conventional three domains tree of life. At the top, the eukaryotes. The bottom, the bacteria. And in the middle, various different groups of archaea. Okay? So don't worry about those groups. They're just different related groups of archaea. That's the traditional three domains tree. We have three domains, the bacteria, the archaea, the eukaryotes. On the right is what much wider sampling, much long, larger gene samples, so we can concatenate sequences of genes together, maybe 40 or 60 genes together, which are basically involved in information. And you can see then a, a stronger signal. If you have many more genes than that, you lose the signal again because genes get passed around like small change by lateral gene transfer. What you can see there is that the eukaryotes are no longer at the top by themselves. They're now branching inside with these other groups of archaea. They're, a sister, they're not a sister group to archaea. They're, they're within the archaea. The host cell was an archaeon. And this, was, uh, this nailed it a, a couple of years ago, the discovery of the Loki archaeota. Um, this is Loki's castle, which is uh, between, on the seafloor between Norway and Greenland. Uh, and, and these were samples taken of the muds un, 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 underneath the hydrothermal vents. And we have no idea what the cells that live there look like. They've never been cultured. They've <clears throat> never been definitely associated a particular cell with a particular genome. These are genome reconstructions, metagenomic reconstruction. And, but it seems to have been done very well and very carefully. And what it shows there, um, the, the, the Loki archaeota, named after Loki's castle, various other groups have been found closely related to them elsewhere in the world now. Uh, and they've all been named after Norse gods. So this is now known as the Asgard superphylum. And we have the Heimdall archaeota and the Thor archaeota and the, uh, what else is there there? the Odin, the Odin archaeota. So <clears throat> you're all descended from uh, Norse gods. Um, and right in the middle of that are the eukaryotes. So it really looks as if the origin of eukaryotes was a pretty simple cell. We can't, we've not seen it. We don't know how simple. It's a relatively unusual archaeon, but still it seems to be a small, simple cell. <coughs> and it had bacteria <coughs> living inside it. And this is the only example that we know of of bacteria with bacteria living inside. There are plenty of examples of bacteria living inside our own type of cell, but this is the only free-living bacteria with bacteria inside. There's one or two other examples which are more equivocal of 
cells within cells inside multicellular eukaryotic organisms. And it begs the question, well, yeah, big deal. Why is that useful in some way? Why would it be a starting point for the evolution of complexity? Well, the answer, to cut a long story short, is almost certainly that mitochondria, those bacteria that got inside, went on to become the power packs of our cells, the mitochondria, they always have genes. They've always retained a genome, except for these few cases where those archozoa lost their mitochondria altogether and became really simple cells again. So across at the, the uh, right-hand side there is paramecium, a single-celled eukaryote. These are the mitochondria in paramecium, and they all have uh, copies of the mitochondrial genome. There's hardly any of it left. There's just a handful of genes, really. In our own case, there's 38 genes. Um, in the case of paramecium, a few more than that. They, they vary across the eukaryotic tree, but never more than about 70 genes found in, in the mitochondria. And then roughly to scale again, we see some bacteria, which are quite complex bacteria with internal membranes, cyanobacteria and nitrogen-fixing bacteria with complex internal membranes. This is not about being able to internalize respiration on, on fancy membranes inside a cell, but it might be about the requirement for genes to control respiration. We don't really know why mitochondria have always retained genes, but they always have, and you have to assume that there's a good reason for it, and the simplest reason is that you need genes to control respiration in some way. I'm just going to leave it at that. But if you do, <clears throat> you can make a prediction, which is that if there are giant bacteria around and you need genes to control respiration, they'd better have a lot of genes, otherwise that idea falls flat on its face immediately. So this is a pulipiscium. It's a kind of battleship of a bacterial cell. And you can see E. coli, that tiny spot there, and paramecium, which I just showed you, is dwarfed by it down at the bottom. Um, so all around the outside of that is the plasma membrane of that cell, and it's the bioenergetic membrane. That's where it's generating energy. If you need genes to control respiration over a wide area of membrane, then they better have a lot of genes. And the cell across the other side is called thiomargarita. Um, and that's even larger. The, the white blob is a single thiomargarita cell, and the thing underneath is Drosophila, a fruit fly. So it's nearly a single bacterial cell is nearly as big as the head of a fruit fly. And again, it's, it's mostly a giant vacuole with a thin film of cytoplasm around it, but it's got a lot of bioenergetic membrane. If you need genes to control respiration, it better have a lot of genes. It has what's called extreme polyploidy, great term. Um, the white dots that you can see, this is uh, DAPI staining of DNA, and these are copies of the complete genome of, of a pulipiscium, the cigar-shaped cell. Um, as many as 200,000 copies of the complete genome. So, tremendous number. And the, uh, across the other side, you can see this is thiomargarita, this giant vacuole, this thin film of cytoplasm, there's 20,000 copies of the complete genome in thiomargarita cells. So we really are talking a lot of DNA. We don't really know what it's there for, but if you add up all of that amount of DNA and calculate um, the, the actual energy available per haploid copy, per single copy of each of these genes, you realize that it's actually got no energetic advantage over E. coli. Neither of them do. This is a, a log scale. They're all down at the bottom because I'm going to add something else in a minute. But essentially, there is no advantage to being big from an energetic point of view if you're a bacterium. You gobble up any additional energy you get by having all these extra genomes. So what's good about this? Well, what's good about this is that these are cells living within a cell. They're not genomes. Genomes are inert. They sit there and have things done to them. These are cells. They're going to grow and divide and make copies of themselves, and they're going to evolve by natural selection. And how do they evolve? Well, they're going to lose genes. That's, again, fairly clear that virtually all intracellular bacteria tend to throw away genes that they don't need, that will allow them to grow a little bit faster, will allow them to gradually dominate. So at the top is the range of genome sizes in free-living bacteria. It now goes slightly beyond that range, up to about 12 megabases of DNA. For comparison's sake, we have 3,000 megabases of DNA. So the largest known bacterial genome is 12 megabases. And we are pretty small compared to some amoeba. The some amoeba have 150,000 megabases of DNA. So you know, there's no limit to eukaryotes. Bacteria are limited by something. And down here at this end, the bottom end, is the, the intracellular bacteria, the endosymbionts and parasites and so on. They're all less than one megabase. They're tiny little cells. 
we can calculate roughly, this is just a, probably a silly thought experiment, but it's an, it's an interesting one. What are the energy savings of losing those genes? These bacteria, they're the mitochondria. They're producing ATP for their host cell. They're losing genes, and we know the end point of the trajectory, they'd lost virtually all their genes. So just to give you a sense of the scale of the difference that it makes, imagine that you have 100 bacteria living inside a cell. And let's say that they're normal bacteria. They're about the same size as E. coli. They've got about uh, 4,000 genes. And let's say that they don't need 5% of those genes. Let's say those genes are for making the cell wall or for making a flagellum. You're living inside a cell. You don't need a cell wall. You don't need to paddle around with a flagellum. You just sit there and food is delivered to you. So you lose those. That's, so that's 200 genes that we're losing. Um, <clears throat> Now, each of those genes encodes a protein, and each of those proteins, on average, in bacteria, is present in about 2,000 copies. And each of those proteins would have a, 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 it's a chain of amino acids, and on average, in bacteria, there's 250 amino acids in that chain to make up a protein. And the cost to join two amino acids together, the total cost of each one, each peptide bond, is about 5 ATPs. So you can work out the energy savings. This is a rough back-of-the-envelope stuff. You can work out the energy savings... Uh, for not making all of those proteins. And we can assume a conservative life cycle, let's say a 24-hour life cycle. The energy savings are 50 billion ATPs. And in a 24-hour life cycle, that's 580,000 ATPs per second. So it's a stupid number. It's almost incomprehensible what that means. Uh, let me try and just give you a, a feel for what it might mean. Let's think of it. One, one difference between bacteria and, and, uh, and eukaryotes is a dynamic cytoskeleton, an ability to change shape and move around in an active way. What does it cost? Well, that's actin in general. So bacteria do have actin, but they don't rebuild it and move around in the same kind of way. So the length of a, of a monomer, actin is a, is a globular protein, and the globules are all joined up into a long filament. So the length of the monomers, each of these globules, is 29 nanometers in length, which means there's 35 of them in one micrometer. And the, the protein, the monomer, is 374 amino acids. It's a dimer, which means it's wound around each other, and we assume the same cost. So we come to a total cost for making one micrometer of actin of 131,000 ATPs which means for those energy savings, you could make four micrometers of actin de novo synthesis um, per second. So, you know, you're effectively flooding the cell with ATP. You don't have to use it. You can turn your nose up at it, but it's there. Uh, you could use it. This is really the difference between bacteria and eukaryotes. And we can put numbers on it, real numbers on it. This is not imagination. These are measured metabolic rates, known genome sizes, and known ploidy. This is what you've already seen, uh, the, the energy per single copies of genes in bacteria. It's a log scale. So Eudlina and amoeba proteus, I think, um, three or four orders of energy, four orders of magnitude more energy per gene compared with, uh, with bacteria. So this really, to me, is the defining signature of eukaryotes. It's not just the nucleus. We are eukaryotes. We have a true nucleus, but we also all have a mitochondrial genome. We have two genomes in every cell, and they are not the same. They are asymmetric. There's a genomic asymmetry in eukaryotes. We have a massive nuclear genome, which is supported energetically by hundreds or thousands of tiny mitochondrial genomes. And, and that's what allows our nuclear genome to increase in size, in DNA content, and ultimately in gene content and complexity. Uh, by so much. It opened the floodgates, having that much more energy. So why did it only happen once? And this is the final slide. Um, there's a double whammy of a bottleneck here. We have at the beginning, a bacterium has to get inside another prokaryotic cell, an archaeon it happened to be. There's no particular reason why it had to be an archaeon. It's not easy to get inside a small cell, which probably has a cell wall. It didn't do it by phagocytosis, but we know of one example of cells within a cell. So we know it can happen, and we know that it probably then, if we know it happened once, it probably happened on millions of occasions across evolutionary time. But then we have this tremendous increase in complexity going to the common ancestor, which was not dissimilar to that Eudlina. Take away the chloroplast, and it was basically the same kind of cell. We don't know how any of those structures arose because there are no surviving evolutionary intermediates at all. 
none that have ever been discovered, and people have spent decades searching for them. I would say that it's to do with the conflict of interests between the intracellular bacteria and the host cell. They've got to reconcile a great deal. And the reason that all eukaryotic cells share so many structures in common is not about adaptation to external environments. You'd think that photosynthetic eukaryotes would do one thing and fungi would do something else and animals would do something else, but we all share the same cell type. It probably arose in response to an internal selection pressure, not an external one, dealing with your own mitochondria. And pretty much everybody who didn't deal with their mitochondria very well ended up falling extinct. Well, that's all three domains. I'm very happy to take questions. A lot of people have contributed to these ideas. This is just a handful of the students who've been involved in some of the modeling work and uh, some of the experimental work on the origin of life that I've not talked about. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>